Accounts of the Whitechapel murders spread like wildfire. Fueled by newspapers only too eager to feed the public's voracious appetite for details. Another murder of character even more diabolical than that perpetrated in Buck's Row. Her throat was cut in a fearful manner. The woman's body had been completely ripped open, and the heart and other organs laying about the place, and portions of the entrails around the victim's neck. An excited crowd gathered around. The press were building it up. The murders were coming quickly on one another. There wasn't space of months in between where people would forget it and go on to something else. This was kept in the public eye continuously for a couple of months. Uh, and because of that, the police took a, a very much a hammering, especially the detective force. They flooded the area with uniformed police officers in the hope, and really I think they realised that probably it's one of the only ways they were going to catch this guy, was to actually catch him leaving the scene of a murder or actually perpetrating a murder. Police surgeon Dr George Baxter Phillips examined Chapman's body some two hours after her death. His conclusions narrowed the field of potential suspects. The injuries could have been done by such an instrument as a medical man used for post-mortem purposes. Those used by slaughtermen might have caused them. Knives in the leather trade would not be long enough in the blade. The mode in which these portions were extracted showed anatomical knowledge. Obviously the work was that of an expert. When Philip's report was made public, it unleashed a frenzy of accusation. Immediately, suspicion fell upon those who used knives in their work, like doctors, butchers and barbers. A lot of people made out that he, he was a doctor, a surgeon. No, it's not that a surgeon, it's a surgeon. He was a hack. And, you know, I think most people just hacking a body would find those sort of things anyway. They'd find the womb and things like that without any problem. Later reports conflicted with Dr. Phillips' assertion. But by then, the court of public opinion, aided by the press, had turned to more convenient, non-English suspects. What was also creating a stir was that the area, sort of in the 1880s, the area had uh, got a large influx of uh, immigrants, Jewish immigrants, many of them were escaping from the pogroms in Tsarist Russia and in, in, in Eastern Europe. So the Jewish community was immediately being targeted as uh, one of their, for, for one of their number, being actually responsible for the murders. Uh, there, it was said no Englishman would do such a terrible thing, and so the Jews were immediately the scapegoat for the murders. One early suspect was a local Jewish shoemaker, known for harassing prostitutes, and by a distinctive nickname. In the yard close to Annie Chapman's body had been, had been found a leather apron, and Immediately the words were circulated that uh, one of the local people, a man called John Pizer, that was his nickname, Leather Apron. And so Pizer was arrested and uh, for the Annie Chapman murder. But fortunately, he got an absolutely cast-iron alibi as to where he was at the time of the murder, so he, he was very, very lucky. With the release of John Pizer, the investigation was back to square one. The Whitechapel murders fell under the jurisdiction of Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Charles Warren. His assistant commissioner for crime was Dr Robert Anderson, who picked Chief Inspector Donald Swanson and Detective Inspector Frederick Aberline to head up the investigation. Overall charge of the investigation was given to Chief Inspector Donald Swanson. Now, he is often described as the office man in charge at Scotland Yard, but he did, in fact, go out and do some inquiries himself, so he was very much part of the investigation as well as overseeing it. Aberline was an ex-watchmaker, very meticulous man. He was um, into surveillance, and there's a fair bit of evidence that they disguised a lot of detectives out on the ground. And also you had the vigilance committees on the street uh, and private individuals who thought they were going to catch the murderer on the street. The vigilance committees were made up of local residents, frustrated by what they saw as the police's lack of progress. Among them, George Lusk, head at Whitechapel's most prominent vigilance committee. He was a vocal critic of the investigation who would later play a more direct role in the case. Then, on September the 27th, a startling development. Now, 19 days after the second murder, a letter arrived at the Central News Agency. Dear boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever, 
and talk about being on the right track. That joke about Leather Apron gave me real fits. I'm down on oars, and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work, and want to start again. You will soon hear of me with my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with. But it went thick like glue, and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope. <laughs> the next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers just for jolly. Wouldn't you? Keep this letter till I do a bit more work, then give it out straight. My knife is so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Now there was a name for the Whitechapel murderer. But with a torrent of letters that bombarded the police weekly, no one could be sure if it was genuine. The newspapers printed the letter a few days later, popularizing the killer's nickname while sending waves of terror throughout the city. In addition to coverage laced with blood-curdling passages, London's tabloids also took aim at Commissioner Warren of the Metropolitan Police. Their editorials and cartoons demanded his resignation. Meanwhile, life for many in the East End grew more desperate. In the area, you've got um, this panic, am this panic among uh, the prostitutes. For one Whitechapel prostitute, Elizabeth Stride, working the streets took its toll. She's crying there. She's afraid. She, 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 she's afraid of being killed by Jack the Ripper. Liz Stride's fears were prophetic. On September 30th, three days after the Ripper letter appeared, she met her final customer, but this time there was a witness. His name was Israel Schwartz, at this point the only person who might positively identify the killer. Schwartz said he saw a person uh, struggling uh, with uh, quarters to one in the morning. Saw him struggling with the lady who he recognised, identified as Stride. She was thrown to the ground. She cried out about uh, two or three times. And Schwartz at that point uh, had walked on. Then he saw a man who was, was threatening, or he thought was threatening, and he ran away. Stride's body was found a short time later, just off Burner Street. Her throat was cut, but there were no other mutilations. The Stride murder is, is, is different from the other Ripper crimes in as much as uh, uh, he didn't mutilate the body. And, but there are a number of reasons for this. One, the most popular explanation, is at the arrival of a man called Louis Deemschutz, who'd been away at a, at a market that day, and he arrived back with his horse and cart and uh, discovered that he was the man who actually discovered the body. It's thought that his arrival, that the Ripper was probably hiding in the shadows somewhere and then made his uh, escape whilst there was all the confusion going along following the discovery of the body. The killer fled west a few blocks encountering another woman outside a nearby church. But of course in 1888 all the traffic was horse-drawn and moved at a much slower pace than it does today. So this made the street in front of this church a good place for the prostitutes to pick up customers. The only problem was that if the prostitute stood still and didn't keep walking about then she could be arrested by the police for soliciting. So what the prostitutes did, and this is why I referred to this church as the prostitutes church, they used this church like a traffic roundabout. If you can imagine long lines of prostitutes going round and round and round the church. On the other side of the street, not far from this church, Catherine Eddowes picked up, or was picked up by Jack the Ripper. Eddowes was seen at 1.35 a.m talking to her killer with her hand on his chest. Within ten minutes of last being seen, Catherine Eddowes was dead. 
At 1.45 a.m., a police constable found her mutilated body in Mitre Square, only a few hundred yards from the church. The face had been slashed down both cheeks. There may have been an attempt to cut off one of her ears. One of the cuts had gone through the tip of her nose, which dropped off into the clothing when the body was picked up. The throat had been cut back to the spine. The clothes had been pushed up, forced up. The insides lifted out and dropped over her right shoulder. And nobody had seen or heard a thing. Not the policeman on the beat, the policeman and his family there, the night porter there, or the witnesses out there. Now remember this is the second killing in 40 minutes.